Um, for those of you who haven't been to a, a GWF event, I see some familiar faces from before. Uh, it's a civic education initiative which aims to um, not just to promote uh, viewpoint diversity here at OU, but also to provide a forum where sometimes contentious subjects can be discussed and debated in a reasoned and reasonable way. And tonight's uh, event, like all GWF events, is uh, not made possible by uh, your student fees or any other public funds, but by generous donations of OU alumni and by grants from private foundations. And in this instance, I need to thank um, the Menard family for, com for uh, making tonight's event possible. So um, the last time um, I was in here and the last time there was a GWF event was in February of 2020, late February of 2020. Um, and we haven't been able to meet uh, in person for the last 18 months. Some of you may have followed the news. There's this thing, COVID-19, you may have heard of it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of turned the world um, upside down. Um, a lot of people lost their lives. A lot of people lost jobs. Some people lost um, friends. A lot of you, there are whole chunks of your life that you're not um, actually going to be able to get back. Um, and I sort of wonder sometimes who actually positively enjoyed any of this, other than our newly sainted public health experts or the insufferably bossy. Uh, I can't think of many um, who've liked it. And it seems to me it's been pretty awful for most people most of the time, um, and even more so than for the young than for the middle-aged or for the old. So part of what um, the GWF is going to be doing in the first two in-person events this fall is actually to provide a forum um, to think about the pandemic in different and maybe at times even iconoclastic um, ways. So next month, um, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford will be here to talk about what might have been done, what we are doing, and what we should do in the future with COVID-19. But tonight, um, we'll start at the beginning. And we're lucky to have someone here um, who is ideally placed to help us understand where COVID actually came from and how its emergence actually fits into the larger story of contemporary geopolitics. So COVID um, first broke out in Wuhan in China and in that city of uh, 11 million people sits the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And there are some, including Josh Rogan, tonight's speaker, who think that COVID-19 actually emerged from that Virology Institute. And indeed in, in April of 2020, Rogan first broke the story that U.S. State Department cables had years earlier warned of safety issues at the Wuhan lab studying bat coronaviruses. At the time um, he broke the story, he was working on a big book, now out, about U.S.-China relations. And so he has, as much as anybody, he's well suited to think about the COVID pandemic, not just within the narrow frames of American domestic politics, but within the wider frame of geopolitics. And I'm grateful he's made the trek here to Athens tonight to come talk with us more about what he's discovered about, about the pandemic's origins uh, and about the country in which it originated. So who is he? Josh is a columnist and for the Global Opinion section of the Washington Post, and he's also a political analyst for CNN. He spent two decades at least traveling all over the world covering foreign policy and national security. And along the way, he's written for the Bloomberg View, Newsweek, The Daily Beast, Foreign Policy, Congressional Quarterly, and uh, Japan's Asahi Shimbun. And he's written a new book, uh, which I encourage you all to buy, um, Chaos Under Heaven, Trump Xi and the Battle Country. So I hope you'll join with me in welcoming Josh Rogan here to OU. Uh, it's really nice to be here. It's really nice to be talking uh, about my support issues with real people in the real room. Uh, I think about six months ago, it's been nothing but the news. What we can know, what we can decide, and what we can debate, and then what we can learn, and what we can expect out of this uh, challenge, out of this shared challenge. Uh, so thank you, Professor, for inviting me. It's really nice. Uh, and, uh, I don't know where to start. I feel like I can tell you a little bit about myself. So, uh, I started out as a college student, like many of you know, and uh, I was at George Washington University in uh, Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever been there, but, uh, you know, the, la the last thing that George Washington University students do is go to class at George Washington University. It's a town where, you know, you can live foreign policy every day. And that's where they have worked on the Hill, and where they see it. 
Japan, I to live in Japan for two years to teach English in Yokohama, and I came back and worked with Sai Yu, the Japanese newspaper in Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, this was in 2004, 2005, and in a very delicate time in the Iraq War, and my job was to come to the Pentagon for the Japanese newspaper. And basically, what we did was, I went to the Rumsfeld Japanese about Rumsfeld, and they rest in peace. And uh, anytime Donald Rumsfeld didn't want to talk about the Iraq War, he would call me and I'd talk about Japan, and he would bring us all over Japan. And after about three years of doing that, uh, I got a job on the Federal Computer Week magazine, and then Congressional Quarterly, and then Foreign Policy magazine, and then News the Daily Beast, and then we were a few of our feeder members sometimes. And then Washington Post, where I work now, and then Side View and CNN, and uh, writing this book. I uh, basically And so, over the course of those 17, 18 years of being in journalism, I traced the China story as close as I could. And what I found was that over the course of those 17 years, a conversation had, that had started almost at the beginning of it uh, progressed in a very slow but very deliberate way. In one specific direction. What I mean by that is, you know, when, uh, let's go back about 20 years, so about the year 2000, 1999, uh, where the United States and our, our countries around the world welcomed China to the World Trade Organization, we gave China the NPR uh, permanent trade organization status. And this was sort of the height of, of, of a period that can broadly be described as a period of diplomatic engagement. Simplifying it a little to be sure, but the basic bet that we had in Washington on the US-China relationship was, and the bipartisan bet, was that if we just gave the Chinese government as much as possible, we just you know gave Chinese or economic and political institutions as much as possible, invested in them as much as we could, let them invest in us as much as they could, that that in and of itself was the best way to encourage China to liberalize first economically and that would cause China to liberalize politically in theory. And then that would follow the rest of the ball around the world. We would have China to be a productive leader, member of the international community, uh, basically more or less working within the system that we had built along with the priorities and that was That was the broad meaning. Now, when I got to journalism in sort of 2004, there were already signs that that had was shaped. Okay? There were already people inside the government, especially looking at the way that the U.S. China was developing, the way that this, the Chinese Communist Party was developing, and saying, is that a good thing? Yeah. And, but still at that time, 2004, 2005, it was pretty clear that that was going to be the policy for the foreseeable future. Now, we had a, a group of sort of young Asian hands in Washington at that time who didn't believe in that at all. And it's not to say that the young Asian hands at that time were a monocle for opinion, but they didn't, they didn't believe that the Chinese Communist Party was, uh, was honoring their side. In other words, they were taking that, they accepted the help that they had ensured without delivering on the promises. But we didn't have any power. I think we were 20 something were in, in any position to influence the relationship. But over the course of many years, a lot of these younger generation of Afghans rose to our ranks, the government, journalism, think tanks. Lobbying organizations, the military, the local city, you name it. And by the time I got to the Washington Post in June of 2016, the situation had changed dramatically. And now there was a, 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 a strong minority in Washington of people, Asian hands included, who were becoming increasingly invested, uh, convinced that China was you know, going a different way. Not because we didn't. Made the offer of engagement honorably, not because we didn't believe it, not because we didn't want it to work out, but because in fact China's development wasn't going to be determined by us. In fact, China's development was going to be determined by the Chinese people, one way or the other. And at least since 2013, when Xi Jinping came to power, it seemed that they decided to go a different way. And we saw that in all sorts of uh, indicators. We saw that in the military expansion. We saw that in the Way that they treated international organizations, we saw that in the economic oppression, we saw that in the oppression that was increasing inside China's borders. Yet still, there was a reluctance to change our basic strategic calculus. 
And yet, the, the strategy of engagement was still the only strategy that our government was pursuing. They had something crazy happen. Donald Trump got elected president. All right? And that thing is a shock to you. I don't give it a shock to me anymore. I don't give it a shock to you guys. Um, I was very shocked. You know what was a shock? The Chinese government was very shocked. And what most of the people inside the government thought, you know, not the Trump people per se, but the, the, the Washington people, they thought, well, okay, the only thing you can really be sure of in the Trump presidency is that it was going to be on the victory. Here you had a president who made a campaign on resetting the US China relationship. In fact, the United States and the Chinese Communist Party at the same time. But inside of that campaign, there was a core argument. This is an argument that Donald Trump as a human being written into several of his books, or at least, you know, told people to write into several of his books. And that argument was that it had been lost, and that the US China relationship was out of whack, and it was going to be the guy to fix it. In fact, he was the only guy to fix it. So for the Asian hands inside the government and around Washington, especially the younger ones, who now are middle aged, right? Uh, this was an opportunity. And they knew that there would be this disruption, whether it was called chaos under heaven, that there was going to be a new strategic approach to China. They just didn't know what it was. But they knew they had to play in that game. So immediately, I mean, right off the bat, the interfactional group began. And you know, if you were the Chinese Communist Party at the time of Trump's election, you would have thought, oh my God, Steve Bannon's going to be running for foreign policy, and that's going to be bad. Uh, but actually, it turned out to be a lot more complicated. So when I was in the Huntington Post two months before Trump won, and then all of a sudden Donald Trump's going to be president of the United States, I'm thinking, oh wow, this is going to be a big story. So I went to my boss, Fred Ryan, the executive editor of the media center of Huntington Post, and I said to him, Fred, you may remember that there was a story that's not called Russia Gate. Remember the book of Mueller, the obsession, the Rudy Jacob, that whole thing, Carter Page, all that. That's what it was. I don't know if he said Russia was the story. And they thought it was a dozen of people working on Russia. So I went to my boss and I said, Excuse me, I want to give you China story. And he said, Okay, what do you need? And I said, Well, I need. Mean, you know, the time and space to report out is going to be a complicated and difficult story about the U.S. China relationships. The U.S. China relationship has a sensitive time. And he said, okay, well, I said, I need to take it around the world. You know, to go back and forth with Asia to see what's going on in the region. And he said, where are you going to go first? And I said, I want to go to Dharamsala and here to visit the Dalai Lama. And he said, okay, we'll find him one. And I'm back at it. And I was off the races. And I spent the next four years traveling over the next three years, rather, traveling around the Asia and Southeast Asia, sometimes with our Asian leaders, sometimes with them, trying to figure out how China's relationship was affecting, first of all, the United States in the region, second of all, how the former, and third of all, how it was all in relationships with Washington and Canada. And it was a pretty great story. And there were a lot of lessons in there, and I, about three years into it, I, I thought to myself, I got a book. I've done a written book, I've done a plan of written book, how hard could it be? Um, everybody seems to be doing it, and I feel like I can do it, and I wonder if someone can do it. So, you know, I came up with a proposal, you know, I had a lot of good reporting, you know, Andrew Dalai Lama, Mike Pence, Steve Bannon, your name, and uh, sold the book contract, uh, and started writing the book, and and I started thinking of the title, Chaos Under Heaven. Well, that's easy, right? Chaos. Trump, for those of you who follow the administration, it was so chaos all the time. The quote is actually from Mao Zedong, we couldn't figure out if Mao Zedong actually said it, but anyway, it's put into Mao Zedong. The quote is, there is great chaos under heaven, the situation is excellent. And what that means is, the, is in the view of the Chinese Communist Party, the more chaos that exists amongst its enemies, the better it is for that. In other words, our internal dysfunction and our dysfunction as a government and as a society feeds into the threat and into their strategy and into the problem that we have. So the okay, that's pretty easy to argue, right? The, the, but they don't tell you when you're writing publishing, you get to the headline, the publisher chooses the subject. Right? They didn't, that was like very good in contract somewhere, if you guys read that part. And so they you know, there's some negotiation. They came up with a Trump machine in the battle for the 21st century. I'm like, wow, that's a whole scene. Is this really the battle for the 21st century? I can afford to be wrong. It's a long time. Or 
worry. Like, is this really the, the most important thing? I'm like, okay, well, that's going to be my job to convince people, to convince you, to convince my readers in the Washington Post, to convince the people who are reading the book, that this is the thing that you have to be focused on, that this is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, and then the rise of China and how it affects us, first of all, the people in Asia, second of all, for Asian women's society, and third of all, us here inside of our own country, is the most important thing that they should be thinking about. Like, that's going to be a, a challenge, but okay, let me take a step. But then the pandemic. And now I don't have to argue. Now it's obvious. Now everybody knows, not just Americans, but everyone in the world, that if you spent the last year, two quarters, you know, not seeing your relatives, worried about your livelihood, you know, your family members, you know, you're losing uh, your job, you know, you're trying not to get sick, that's the coronavirus. You know, and we can debate how much that, uh, but for sure you know that the uh, actions and character of the Chinese Communist Party exacerbated your suffering. That, we, again, we can get into the details of the battle, but it, it's undeniable and obvious that how China handled this pandemic cost lives, American lives, lives all over the world, continues to cost lives. What am I talking about? Okay, well, you know, and we can get all, all this in the question and answer too, but basically, I'm talking about, uh, first of all, the number. Forget about the origin, just the number, just from what we know. We'll get into the origin in a second. But, you know, when, when did the coronavirus pandemic start? Let's just start from there. Does anyone have a, a guess? Anyone? Right, that's what most people say, seven twenty nine. That's what we're like to be. There is a, an enormous amount of evidence that actually started in September or October twenty nineteen. Now, just that to make that statement a year ago would have been considered extremely controversial, perhaps out of bounds. But in, we now know from a lot of reporting and documents and research that actually there's a lot of ton of evidence that it was sort of many four months earlier. Even we knew it. So that means, what does that mean? The Chinese government was uh, covering up the outbreak for four months longer than we had even suspected. Uh, what else? Okay, well, the reaction in the first month uh, the centering of the science, the yelling of the journalists, the yelling of the scientists, uh, the, the uh, misinformation, not the, not the lack of information, the misinformation that was fed to the WHO, not the wrong information. Uh, and then the withholding of the virus saying, Holding of the data, which we use to this day, the forwarding of the investigation. That's just in the beginning. That's just from the drop. That's just the first few months. All of that, uh, you know, uh, exacerbated greatly the amount of confusion that fed into all of our responses. It doesn't excuse any of the crazy stuff that our government did that was terrible. It doesn't excuse hydrochloroquine or, you know, sticking needles of bleach into your butt or whatever it was. People told you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying that at the same time, what we what we already know about the UK in the land or whatever was that the Chinese government has been lying and covering up uh, crucial public health data uh, that is exacerbating the suffer of millions of people continue to do so. Okay, then you get to the how China decided to use its first mover stat, really the first example we ever had of China as a world power. With a first mover event, remember, just tell you where the outbreak started. The first data, the first to have uh, testing, the first to have you know, uh, hospital care, the first to have uh, vaccines, the first to have therapeutics, not vaccines, but therapeutics. And what we've seen over the course of the last year and a half is that the Chinese Communist Party has used this, this advantage to uh, exacerbate our suffering even more, not just our people of the world. What do I mean by that? Well, Let's start with the things that I just reported in the book. <laughs> you know, it's kind of crazy to think about, but what actually happened was that when the Biden administration, I'm sorry, the Trump administration began to make the outbreak, again, a very confusing time in all of our own lives. Welcome on. One is. Um, just to get you guys up, I'm talking about the coronavirus. <laughs> China. Uh, First thing, Trump, so I'm in, in writing this book in quarantine, in my basement, literally. Uh, and now, my, what, what I thought was going to be like a really interesting book about the U.S. China relationship in our lives has turned into the most important story of the 
century because the pandemic is, is the thing that will change all of our lives forever. And the U.S. China relations will wrap up into it in so many different ways. So now that the pandemic has blocked us all of our houses, I know excuse not to write the book. Good and bad, how do you excuse I could actually write the thing? But at the same time, the pandemic is playing out. As I'm writing, so flying and playing public at the same time. But I was in a position where I could follow this stuff because I was doing all the reporting and having resources. And what I kept finding was that inside the system, inside our government, a, a lot of the confusion was caused by the deliberate and malign actions of the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. First of all, President Xi Jinping, right? And remember when Donald Trump invited him to Mar a Lago, and he's talking to Kate, he's never seen, maybe he became best friends, Jared Kushner's kids sang in Chinese. It was the, the beginning of the romance. And for many years, for whatever reason, Donald Trump, the president, said, believe that he was good friends with Xi Jinping. He thought they were he thought they were just really, you know, had this special friendship that was going to deal with all these great results. And of course, President Xi used that against President Trump to extract fear from him at various times. Oh, you know, do you mind if we commit a genocide against the Uyghurs? I was like, yeah, that's fine, right? Do you mind if we quit Hong Kong? Okay, that's fine. But when it came to the coronavirus, Xi Jinping used that personal relationship to lie to the President of the United States in a way that was materially harmful to our response and our public health. And what he told him was two separate conversations in the book, Chaos hey, Under Heaven, chapter 14. <laughs> Xi Jinping told the President of the United States that it would go away in warm weather, and that herbal medicine would treat it, and that uh, everything was under control, you didn't have to worry about it. And two days later, after the call when President Trump is on TV, he says, well, many people are saying that the drug drivers are going away in warm weather. He didn't tell us many people was the Chinese President, who had to be lying through his teeth, to, because he was trying to cover up the outcome. So what you had to tell the US government was repeating narrative between those people who wanted to were warning very seriously at the same time. And this is looking at a lot of the national security officials um, who spoke Chinese and who were following Chinese social media and who knew what the Chinese government had done during the first SARS crisis. And they factored this into their decision making. On the other side of the way, you had the political people like Michael Fagan and Steve Mnuchin who were, and Jared Kushner who were telling the president, no, 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 don't worry about this. We have to keep the economy going. You're running for re-election. You just started like picking one deal with China. There's no way that we can blame China for any of this stuff or call them liars for any of this stuff. You're gonna, it's going to result in you're going to lose your power. You're going to destroy the airlines and destroy the stock market in the middle of your election. It's crazy. And this horrible inside of, this, of Donald Trump's head, he went to his good friend, Xi Jinping, and broke the tie and decided, don't worry about it. And that had a huge effect, negative effect on our public health. Then, when they blacked out the State Department uh, to shut up about the coronavirus provisions in order to, uh, to the, and they held over our heads on masks on our PPE. Maybe you guys remember March, March and April 2020, there, was, there weren't any masks going on, right? But like, when first responders would get like, masks and shields and gloves, there's a reason for that. It's because the Chinese government scooped up all the masks and PPE, bought them all over the market, all over. When did they do that? My friend said December. You know when they bought, when the Chinese government bought up all the masks? O October. Well, that's kind of weird. But all the masks two months before the outbreak doesn't make any sense. So then we didn't have any masks. We shipped all, but then we gave them a bunch of masks, donated them to the of our hearts, and then when it came our time to have an outbreak, we tried to get our masks from our factories in China, like the Korean factory in China. And then they, the Chinese partner, which you call the state partner, told them if you want your mess, they'll shut up about it and run it. So, you know, and on, don't even get me started with the vaccine. And then you had the Chinese government go around every country in the world to blackmail, of course, the ones that were going along with the party. So in Australia, it called for an investigation into the origins of COVID, the Chinese government sanctioned their entire beef and wine industry, killing their agricultural. Uh, industry in the middle of a pandemic. You know, um, when the Netherlands, you know, made a mass deal with Taiwan, they uh, punished them diplomatically. Um, you know, the same thing with the vaccines. 
vaccine diplomacy on a broad scale. The nation of Paraguay wanted vaccines. They didn't really want the Chinese vaccines, but they would take them. If they were offered them, the Chinese said, you have to de-recognize the country of Taiwan if you want your vaccine. They put them under choice between recognizing Taiwan or getting life saving medical equipment. Now, if you think about that, it certainly tells you all that you need to know about how the Chinese Communist Party handled this pandemic. Because they weren't making these moves in advance of China's national interest, per se. They weren't making these moves in, 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 to the, uh, with, uh, with the mind towards China's economic interest, per se. These were political moves, right? And these were moves to avoid relationship liability for the outbreak and to fulfill the party's political agenda, like de recognize Taiwan. And on and on and on. So I'm going to spoil it all for the by the book, you know, but suffice to say that this went on. So it was around this time that I started to hear all this chatter and suddenly was government about when it went to about this my house. And Robert, I appreciate an introduction, but to be very clear, I'm not here to tell you that uh, the coronavirus is from the, the China. That's not actually what I'm here to say. Uh, we don't know how the coronavirus had done in Korea. But I think that we have to check out a lot of theories. And one of those theories is that it might have been linked in some way to the United And one of the labs we find dealing with that coronavirus. In other words, not that we know anything about labs, simply that we can't roll it up, we have to check it out. And that for a year and a half, we haven't been able to check it out because there's a lot of crazy reasons and a lot of crazy politics and a lot of, uh, you know, behind the scenes corruptions that have, have brought us to a point where we're not able to have uh, uh, an honest and open independent investigation into how we got into this mess. And, you know, talking about the origins of the pandemic is important, not because we're trying to blame China. Because again, if you want to blame China, you have the and I don't, but I'm not in the business of blaming China. I'm just saying that if you were in the business of blaming China, you don't need the origin Debate in order to do that because of the long litany of defenses I've already laid out. So it's really not about the pandemic. The reason that we need to find the origin of the pandemic is because we need to know how to prevent the next one. In other words, if we don't know how this started, then we don't know how to fix our system to prevent the next one. You know, in any natural disaster, plane crash, nuclear meltdown, you name it. The most obvious thing to do is to figure out what happened. Right? You wouldn't have a plane crash, like if the Boeing planes went into the mountain, and then you're like, oh, what happened? Oh, we couldn't figure it out. Just keep flying the Boeing, Boeing planes. That'd be crazy. No, if the plane flies into the mountain, you figure out why you're in the mountain before you put that plane back or a plane like it. But here we are, you know, a year and two thirds into the pandemic, and we've no idea. So anyways, there I was in my basement writing a book and uh, going through all the uh, uh, you know, research and stuff. I started to catch on this chat from inside the government. And the chat was something like what you've now heard from like, John Stewart. It was sort of like, first it was like a question about Austin Like if, the, if, if there was an outbreak of chocolate goodness in Hershey, Pennsylvania, you might want to take a look at the chocolate factory, right? And that was sort of the basis of the initial people. So sort of like, wait a second. Well, wait a second, there's people inside the room. You're telling me that there's a back coronavirus research lab 10 miles from the back coronavirus pandemic out there, but we're not allowed to talk about the lab or not. Should we look at that lab? It started out as simple as that. Uh, but again, at this time, because we're being blackmailed by the Chinese government for our masks or our PPE, no one can say that lab. And, but it's sort of like chatter, but we look inside the system on catch. And then, all of a sudden, I hear about these cables, right? I'm like, what are these cables? Well, apparently, some diplomats had gone to one of these labs, the one in the virology, two years prior to the outbreak, and had written back cables to Washington, which warned about these labs, said two things. One was that they were following great safety procedures, they didn't have the proper staff, according to them. In other words, that they were doing risky research in an environment that could not be verified as safe, and that we had no insight and in, 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 no oversight of. And two, that the specific research that they were concerned about was the back coronavirus research and the research about how they could get more infectious to humans. And again, that doesn't speak 
they all written because these, this was, these cables were written two years prior to the Apple II, but suffice to say that these cables made a prediction. The prediction was, hey, if you don't do something, there could be a bad coronavirus outbreak in your companies on that. And that would bring into our diplomatic history, although at the time they were ignored. So I thought this man, I gotta get these cables. You know, that's a piece sort of news, not news that I don't find these cables. So I tried it up when I knew it, and I fixed my Pompeo, who, you know, I don't know if you guys ever know how familiar you are with Mike Pompeo, but he's not a big fan of the press. He's not a big fan of reporters, just doesn't care for them generally. I'm no exception to that one, but I just come up like, listen, you know, Mike Pompeo, this is important for history. It doesn't matter, you know, you know what you think about the lab or the market or whatever it is. If this happened, you should give me these cable things and this is important. This is for the public now. And he said, no, for you. And so, all right, fine. You know, let me find them some other way. So, you know, I'm pretty good at what I do. I just found a source of people to give you the cables. And sure enough, he said what I heard. And said, hey, we've got a bunch of dangerous labs coming to the back of our research, and uh, if nothing happens, it could be a dead end of the lab. And I published the cables, and that's what all hell broke was, you know? And <laughs> I mean, looking back, I didn't really think it was going to be that big of a story, but it turned out to be quite a big story because once the idea that the, the, the lab leak theory wasn't totally based on nothing had come out, Mike Pompeo decided to switch sides in a couple of years, which was actually like, really unhelpful when you think about it, because everyone just thought it was lying. And they, they asked Donald Trump the next day, they were like, hey, Trump, do you think it came from the lab? And he said, well, I can't really tell you what he does when you ask me. Right? And then everyone was like, oh, he's definitely lying. And in that instance, the thing became politicized. Super politicized. And, you know, you guys don't know me, but I'm not a, a partisan man, right? I'm a foreign policy reporter, I'm a foreign policy com columnist, I have opinions, I'm basically a center left guy, um, you know, I'm very critical of the CCP and stuff like that. Inside. But if you read my book, it's not a pro Trump book, it's not an anti Trump book. There's a lot of criticism of the Trump administration, and there's some criticism of the things that went right, especially on China. But anyway, the point is in that moment, once Donald Trump was like, yeah, I think it was a lot, but I won't tell you anything about it, that was the thing was over. And instantly everybody was excited. And then the President of the United States did something really cruel, which is that he sort of linked the coronavirus outbreak with uh, phrases on the here that are racist and, and racist against Asian Americans, apparently they're Americans. And he merged the coronavirus origin story with racism and prejudice in a cool way. And that caused these two issues to become uh, linked in a way that's actually done, that they otherwise would not. In other words, you know, the left, the, I, I believe that it's undeniable that, you know, that, our, the president, that President Trump was so racist and anti hate while he was doing it, while he was on the campaign trail, that's terrible. Terrible for our society, for those members of our community. But that has nothing to do with the lab. There's no reason that, that the origin of the coronavirus should be linked to that, other than the President of the United States linked them. So they became linked. And of course, that caused most Democrats, especially the progressives, to be reflexively against talking about the lab in the period because it was linked to racism against Asian Americans. And that put a chilling effect on the journalists. So, and then of course, that was stoked. On the other hand, by the Chinese Communist Party, so yes, that thing was talking about all that. <laughs> so, in that environment, it was a really difficult thing to talk about, a really difficult thing to report on. But yeah, that's not the way to book it, so I had deadlines and, you know, this is going on. Long story short, we're still living in that legacy, we're still living in that environment where issues like how we got into this pandemic uh, have become so entangled with the mess that was going on in the Trump administration that we it's hard for us to have a Factors. That's what I'm here to do. To sort of pull back because the origin of the coronavirus is not a political issue. Okay? It's not even a scientific issue. It's a forensic issue. Something bad happened. We have to figure out what it was. And, you know, there are a couple other things that I haven't mentioned to, to get you up to speed on how we got to this mess. 
So yeah, Trump comes in and says, oh yeah, we definitely think the lab's good and you know, I'm not gonna tell you why, and you know, racist term, racist term, racist term. Uh, in come the scientists, right? And this kind of blew my mind at the time because again, I was sort of in the know, you know, I was writing the book and doing the work and I felt like I really knew what I was doing for once in my career. And uh, here come the scientists and they say, it's a conspiracy theory, they talk about what? And I was like, wait a second, how, well, how is that possible? And if you were a major news of, let's say, at New York Times, and you had Trump and Pompeo on one side, and then you had uh, you know, a bunch of scientists, you would probably go to the scientists, right? That makes sense. That's what all the reporters did. They're all, you know, everyone, except for a couple. You know, like, oh yeah, Trump's definitely a liar, the scientists are definitely telling the truth. It's a conspiracy, it came from the market. Now, the Chinese government is about you just look at the basic science that everyone agrees on, there is no chance that, that this originated from the market. In fact, the Chinese set up for the CCC told it. They, they have a CCC, they have a CCC, there's a single line. This is about the market goes to the end of the line, put that aside, it didn't really matter. The scientists said it was, the American scientists said it was the market, Trump said it was black, I mean, he said it was the market. And what turned, it, as it turned out, in the end, and I don't say this lightly, it turns out that some of those scientists were corrupted. And they, they were corrupted because they had a conflict of interest. Because they were, uh, their careers and their legacy in their friends were tied in with these Wuhan labs. In other words, the labs were found to be associated with that way. These very scientists lose their money and their reputation and their businesses, which is a pretty big incentive. Now, the conflict of interest it, 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 it exists whether they or not. The corruption is an allegation on them based on their actions, not the act of And I think I can back it up, but you read the book, you read the judge. Then come the intelligence officials, okay? So then you have the scientists and the Trump people, and then the intelligence officials are sort of like, oh, wait a second, this is destabilizing, right? Because now we have a new problem with the US China relationship. And so they sort of lead that you know, that is the lab and very in order to sort of rebuff the Trump administration. If you remember what was going on at the time, there was a war between the Trump people and the intelligence people. And that happened for this too. And, you know, by the time the election happened, it was just so screwed up, nothing could make it, had to tell it. And that's the tragedy, because again, as the time went on, the evidence gets weaker, we can't figure out how to get into this we can't get the samples, we can't get the investigation, we don't know how to fight the virus, we don't know how to invent the next world tragedy for the world. So the election happens, and after Trump loses, things got very weird in Washington. I don't know how close you guys are. I've been living in Washington for, you know, I'm doing a ton. It's like a good one. Okay, so, um, and we're going to have a question and answer. You can get into whatever you want. We'll talk about Afghanistan and Syria, whatever North Korea you want to do. But this is really important, so I just want to sort of lay out for you how we got to where we are, and then how it goes to the U.S. general relationship. So, after Trump lost the election, Washington became a very dystopian place because the president didn't accept the results, the transition wasn't happening. Uh, you know, nobody really knew what to do, nobody really knew what was going on. Then the riots came, then Texas went up, and the city that I was born for 20 years came with a pizza. It was very weird, very sad. You know, I was in that world around my campus at the Russian University covered with that's the word, never seen that. In that confusion, the head of the Trump administration did a lot of stuff in China. And in those final days, they pushed out a lot of stuff. By this point, Trump had realized that Xi Jinping was not his friend. He came to understand that he had lied to, and that despite all the beautiful times they had with the Trump being at Mar-a-Lago, Xi Jinping didn't actually have his best interests in mind. So they started to, so he released his back to three people and do whatever they wanted. This is when we got like the TikTok ban. You remember the ban TikTok? The trans ban TikTok. Do you guys really think that's like the most important thing? You know, like, exactly the most. Is that really what we're have to spend our national security time doing? Stopping the Chinese from watching us dance or things like that? No, it's not the most important. But that's the kind of stuff they were up to. One of the things they did was the genocide, right? They had a, a an ongoing mass atrocity, and they called it a genocide, and that stuff. And um, one of the things was that they released a, a fact sheet that made broad claims about these Wuhan labs. 
based on what they did is they alleged that the labs were doing secret coronavirus research with the Chinese military, that they hadn't disclosed, and that there were sick researchers at the lab that had COVID like symptoms, and that they were doing a lot of back coronavirus stuff that they didn't tell us. In other words, one of the main arguments that it couldn't have come from the lab was that people said, well, we don't have that. They're just doing open science. Why would they hide a research are we all trying to say, okay, it's not a pandemic? And as it turns out, uh, no, we're doing open science. As it turns out, there's something different than ours. As it turns out, when you have a bio uh, a virus developing research program in China, of course, no one is as well. That's, that's how the system operates. At that time, most people would report that information. At that time, a lot of other crazy stuff was going on. It was hard to focus on that. But when the mining team came in, I went to them and I pressed them to check out this information. Hey guys, I know you're busy, but um, kind of need to find the source of the pandemic. What do you think? Are you going to look into it? And they said, okay, guys, we're going to look into it. And, and to their credit, they did. They confirmed most of the information that the Trump administration put out. Not all of it. They didn't say they thought it came from the lab. What they said was the information that the Trump administration put out about the Wuhan lab is accurate. Just think about that. The Biden administration confirmed that this network of risky labs was doing undisclosed research with the Chinese military on bad coronaviruses, and that the researchers had like, got sick in November 2019, not December, they got sick in November. Now, if they got sick in November, that means they caught it pretty early because they were not COVID again, not the time that they heard. So that seems like a big deal. So then I, I went back to the Biden people and I said, you know, Okay, so what do you feel about it? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you just, you know, said that it's, you know, the, there's enough, it seems like evidence to me. You can't say there's no evidence. If you've got the same research, the research, the intelligence. I'm like, what are you going to do about it? Like, what do you mean? I'm like, what do you, how are we going to find this answer to this question? And they had to think about it, and they decided to order an IMT intelligence review. You may have heard about it. And I was like, okay, well, that's something. And, you know, once they had done that, once the first thing Biden had come out and said to the American people, hey, listen, we're doing a review. And we're going to review both theories, whether it came from a natural spillover in, in, in nature or whether it came from a uh, connection to one of these labs. Once the, Joe Biden had said that, well, all of a sudden it can't really be a conspiracy in the cabinet. Because in order for that to continue, Joe Biden would have to be in on the conspiracy, which he's clearly not. Right? It's, not, it's not a Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, Joe Biden conspiracy theory. It doesn't make any sense. So once President Biden said, hey, the left theory is not a conspiracy theory, well, that changed the debate, it changed the discourse. All of a sudden, people started to report on it. All of a sudden, things started to come out. All of a sudden, you were depressed on this case. But still, it was very slow. And anyway, you know how the story ends. They did a 90 day review where they didn't. They, they didn't do any interviews, they didn't do any investigations, they basically looked at their own files, came to the conclusion that they couldn't figure it out, and then they threw up their hands. And that's where we are. And, you know, the World Health Organization, when they did their study, I mean, you know the story. They, they hired the scientists that were the best friends of the Wuhan lab, who went to the Wuhan lab and said, did you do it? They said, no. They said, okay, it's sort of out you. And then they said, very likely, we will move forward to the labs. And then when the head of the WHO, Dr. Pagos, is, is it now? They, uh, they found us. <laughs> I knew, I knew if I talked about this stuff long enough, they would be Anyway, we know, the point is, we're no one else. Okay? The WHO has failed. The Biden administration has stopped crying. The congressional investigations are all solved. Uh, the scientists who are the best friends of the lab have not volunteered to hand over the information that they have in their possession. The intelligence community essentially look for its keys under the streetlight. You know, like if you, you know, the drunk in the streetlight, you're like, looking, why are you looking for keys on the streetlight? Well, the lights are there. You know, and here we are, here and a half later, and we're done. And what's crazy about that is that the actual plan for responding to the uh, pandemic, according to the current government plan, is to take this research, this collaboration, this scientific collaboration, with uh, these Chinese scientists to expand it and to expand sixfold the project to dig up the entire cell of the world and bring it back to China. 
And my base start going to be like, hey, well, should we try to figure it out before we do that? Should we just try? So, uh, you know, that we can get into that if you want. I think where that sort of brings us back to is, you know, what does that mean for US China relations and China's and, and the interaction between China and the rest of the world? And I think what it shows us is two things. One is that, you know, for those people who still feel like the engagement is the right path, for many, that's not to say we have to cut off our relations with China. I'm not advocating for decoupling the world from economies. We can't live in two different worlds. It's not going to work. We're, our interconnectedness is, is unavoidable and eternal. However, for those who advocate a pure engagement based strategy, well, if you can't cooperate and engage on something like that, then you can cooperate. If even the science, we can't have a honest conversation about how to win, especially how to get out of it. Well, that doesn't spell it. But that doesn't mean that's not going to be super as part of the engagement strategy. And I think what it also tells us is that you know all of our institutions in our society are confronting a, a similar problem, which is that their well-being engagement with their Chinese counterparts is now changing. And that's because what's happening is China is changing. It's because the party is asserting more control, asserting more power. Control and that means that when you're dealing with a, 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 a Chinese institution in this kind of engagement, you're dealing with the party, and the party wins, and the party has control. And I'm sure those very many scientists that have gone to virology are top scientists. I'm sure that they were honestly trying to solve the pandemic, and I'm sure if their <coughs> research accidentally led to the outbreak. That they feel more of and I'm not accusing them of doing anything wrong. What I'm saying is that in their system, the way it operates right now, those scientists are not allowed to say what they think, and they're definitely not allowed to say what they know. And once you realize that the party is increasingly controlled, both internally and externally, well, that has to come to your decision making. And that's sort of gets into the influence part of it, which is sort of how the, the, what's going on in China, how the Chinese Communist Party is changing, affects us. I've given you the bubble health example in the industry that you can tell. But I can do the, a, a, a similar explanation for how the Chinese Communist Party is um, uh, changing character and why actions affect us in our own universities and in our tech companies and in our Wall Street firms and in our stock markets and in our media and in our politics. And I mean, I'm happy to go into any of those in the QA, but the, the bottom line is that. You know, one of the things that's hardest to talk about in our relationship with China is the fact that the Chinese Communist Party has a comprehensive, well-funded, worldwide program of influence operations uh, under the rubric of what's called the United Front. And it's a network of government, party, and proxy organizations that advance the party's interests, both inside China and inside the part of society. And we can see it everywhere. And, you know, and it's difficult to talk about because it's designed to be difficult to talk about. And when we understand that this is part of the way the party is expanding its part of the system, well, then that depends on a uh, response. And when I was in the book, what I found is that those responses are being debated inside of our institutions in various ways, but not amongst them. And, you know, a lot of times, because the, our institutions in America guard their independence from the government. Seriously, and right, and our system, universities don't want to be told what to do in China, nor do tech companies, nor do the Wall Street firms, for that matter. Definitely not the media organizations. This is a problem that requires some interaction between our government and our private sector. It's a problem that's too big for any one of our institutions to handle on their own. Look at the NBA. You know, Daryl Morey, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Daryl Morey, uh, had a career as an actor security expert before he ever got into basketball. He was a CIA contractor. He was a, a, a PhD statistician. Well before he was the man who was the um, Remember you guys saw him well? He had yelled at him all that research. So Daryl Murray is a national security expert. He knew what he was doing when he did his stand in Hong Kong. It wasn't some sort of like offhand Thing he noticed on Twitter, he understood, he understood, he understood exactly what he was doing. 
The NBA got represented this year at four hundred million dollars. Four hundred million dollars for one team. Right? What is that? What's going on? Right? In one instant, in in in, in one thousand millions of NBA fans, we realize that oh wait a second, we're dealing with something new here. We're dealing with a foreign government, a foreign uh, a party that runs a foreign government that's telling us what to do in our society. It's not enough for them to repress their own people to tell them, to tell them what to say and what not to say. Now, we can't do what we want on our Twitter, which is bad in China, by the way. That's a, something new. It's an exportation of their social credit system. That's them imposing on our free speech in, in our own country. That's, that, is, that is something that we can't abide by. Uh, so, you know, when the MD story happened, Millions of Americans were just be sort of woke up to the idea of winning something. What's that about? Oh, well, it's the party against these political interests. Okay, what's that connected to? Well, it's connected to what they're doing at home. And by that, I mean the, the, the genocide. And the genocide is, is, is the controversial thing to talk about because not everyone agrees it's a genocide, right? They, you'll, you'll find some people out there who will say, well, is it really a genocide? What's the technical definition of genocide? Maybe it's just a crime against humanity, maybe it's just mass atrocity. The legal definition of genocide is such that what it says is that you have to have an intent to destroy a group in all or in part. In other words, it's not enough to destroy a group. You have to intend to destroy it. That's the genocide. And that's where people who want to deny the genocide will hang around. So, well, you know, I have to think of bullshit. I think the intent is pretty clear. When you have a system that, you know, has mass sterilization, mass forced abortion, population control, tens of thousands of orphans, separate from parents forever, forced labor system, <coughs> stuffing out of cultural norms, destruction of hundreds of mosques. That's the thing. You guys forget about it. If you don't think it's a good outside, by the legal definition. What's happening in that part of China is uh, horrific. And, you know, it's true. And I know that the play for you. The victims and their stories are real. And you can say, okay, well, you know, that's over there, that's not over here. You can say, well, that's not a problem. You can say, oh, well, they have their country, they want to abuse their people, that's their business. But again, it's not enough for the Chinese Communist Party to just kind of genocide against speakers. And other ethnic minorities, by the way. They insist that we mark people with. What do I do about that? Well, you know, one of the things that the Trump administration did in those final days, when after the writers came and everything was going on, was they, they stopped a, a, a shipment of uh, human hair. 17,000 pounds of human hair coming from Xinjiang. And they, they turned it right. said, no, we're not going to take it. You, know, you can't drop it off in the United States. We don't want it. And that was part of the ballistic, and, you know, propaganda, and accusation, and racism. Um, do you think those Uyghur women were properly compensated for that hair? Do you think that, because I talked to a bunch of them, they never really said they didn't get a knot in the hair, they would shave off their heads and the women were compensated again. Do you want to put that hair on your head? Does that bother you? Maybe it doesn't, I don't know. Bothers me. What if it's just cotton that goes into your nineties? Do you care? Do you care that after that Uyghur woman had her hair chopped off, Sent to a camp for two years, lost her children, got out of the camp somehow, got sent to the cotton factory, the cotton, you know, mill. Okay, is she a slave? Well, not really, she can eat, but she can't do you know, the choice. She can leave the factory, she can't go home, she can't go to fight her kids. Does, does that bother you? It bothers me. But again, this is a problem that we can't solve by ourselves. We can't, this is something that only the government can handle. But it just shows you the, the, the level, the level of the challenge and how complex it is. So anyway, it's making a long story short. Uh, in those final days, when everything is crashing in and watching again, inviting people coming in, uh, you know, there, there, there was no handoff. There was no point where the Trump people said, okay, you just box this stuff in China. And now you have the box and go for it. It never happened. So why do we get in there and they're like, okay, what's going on? You know, how's it going to go with this US China relationship? And they're like, oh my god, it's pretty bad. 
And so they start going for a roll at all. And that's what they're doing. And they soon find that a lot of the things that the Trump administration did were done poorly, but some of them were done well. And then they started to pick through them. And then right as they started to do that, the fights inside the Biden administration began. And that's where we are now. We're in a phase where an initial sort of honeymoon period is breaking down inside the Biden administration. I think you see it all on issues, but especially on China. And it's breaking down into this very complicated, very serious question that we've been dealing with here tonight, which is, well, this is a big complex problem. And the reason it's a complex problem is because often the China challenge poses two American values against each other. In other words, in our schools, in our, in our university, right? We want to encourage exchanges. We want to encourage Chinese students to come here. We want to encourage American students to go to China. It's a good thing. We need to talk to each other. We need to interact with each other. Uh, at the same time, we want to protect our students from uh, their academic freedom. So what happens when Chinese students come here and just fight on the government by their own consequences? What happens when a Chinese student organization tries to stop the dollar from coming into campus? You know, what happens when a Confucius Institute sprouts up and Confucius Institutes are all different? Well, there are some are worse than others, some are benign, some are not. Um, Runs up and all of a sudden it becomes a, a space for uh, collection of intelligence, which is a real example. These are very complex problems. Right? These are very difficult things to talk about, very difficult things to solve. And inside the Biden administration, I think you just started to realize how difficult it really is. Uh, I'll leave you with a story about the Biden administration, and then I'll, I, I do want to hear your questions. Frankly, I'm really interested in how you guys have these issues. Um, <laughs> so, on the the two days before the end of the Trump administration, they set up this sanctum against the Chinese solar companies. You guys might have heard about this. But they didn't get it done. They actually they ran out of time. So the Biden people come in, and there's a package waiting for them. <coughs> well, we, Chinese solar panels, Chinese policy, silicon, 40% of which comes from Xinjiang, is connected to forced labor pretty easily. You know, there's not, it's not really a hard case to make. Well, well, it says if we have to force labor going anymore, Silicon happens and they can't come to the United States, it's pretty clear. So the Biden people, when they had something to stop, they decided, okay, we're going to ban that. But those four guys. And what ended up happening was the tanks are retired, climate change people, it's blown to China. And the country goes to China and they say, hey, how can we cooperate with you on climate change and send it to our entire solar industry? How can you kill our solar industry? Well, asking them to cooperate with the young man doesn't make any sense. So, Joe Biden goes back to President uh, Joe, Joe, Biden. President Biden says, you know what, they don't want. And then, you know, and then, so then you can see the problem. You know, we want to stop forced labor, but we don't want to stop climate change. What I argue is that we can't stop climate change from the past slaves. What I argue is that actually we can't. Base our renewable industry on a, a dirty coal plant in China. That it doesn't make any sense to pursue a strategy where we ignore China's abuses in order to get our our gains. Um, I, I'll, I'll close here. You know, John McCain, the senator uh, from Arizona, he would always. He would always do the same point. He would say, he would always go with Mao, right? He would say, as Mao would say, it's always darkest before it goes completely black. That was dumb. Now, what's funny about that is that Mao no, was And John McCain was like, he didn't like going out, but he wasn't missing going out. Uh, so that's a fair depiction of where U.S. China relations are at this moment. It looks really dark. It looks really bad. But there is a way out. There is a way <clears throat> to avoid both the Cold War and what we're going to be like the And for me, it goes both something like this. It means, first of all, engaging China in a way that says, you know, we are not looking to change China. We're not looking to shape China into a global out of society. What we're looking for is a way that we can all live together, but in order to do that, the Chinese government has to change.
changing his behavior. And if we won't change his behavior, then what kind of change our behavior to react? So that's a try to protect ourselves. And then the second part of that is to fix our society and our government and our industries and our institutions in order that we could be better. In other words, rather than demonizing China or pursuing policies that would lead to more conflict with China, perhaps the best way to meet the China challenge is to be the best version of ourselves, to live up to the ideals that we profess to believe in, and to create a better system and society that upholds things like democracy and freedom and human rights and the rule of law and pluralism and decency and intolerance. Um, because that ultimately is the way that we want to live, and that's ultimately our competitive advantage against the alternative that the Chinese Communist Party is putting forth. In other words, the best way to be China is to be the best version of ourselves. At the same time, we theorize about the way China is going and about the CCP and its threat of our national security, our public health center, prosperity, and our freedom. And if we can do both of those things and then take the politics out of it, um, we'll be on our way to address meeting this challenge. But um, it's not going to be something that we can do in Washington. Um, we had better start now. Uh, with that, I'll take